Hello, everybody. Thanks again for joining me for the Big Picture of Scripture course. Today we're doing Lecture 10, which is on Noah. And we're, in fact, covering Genesis 4 through 10, uh, 4 through 9, rather. So let me get us rolling here. So, as I mentioned, this is Lecture 10 on Noah, and we're covering Genesis 4 uh, through 9. I kind of just wanted to talk about where we left off, really, in Genesis 1 through 3. We saw that Adam failed as, as humanity's representative, right? Uh, we, in a sense, we see that he was a covenant representative, at least to some degree, and in, in that he kind of uh, informally served in the role of prophet, priest, and king. As a prophet, he was to speak God's word to, to God's world. As a priest, he was to guard God's divine sanctuary and meditate God's blessings to the world. And as a king, he was to rule God's world. I took that from uh, just an excerpt from the Westminster Theological Seminary. But a Adam served as kind of our, our representative, and, and he failed in that in sinning. And ultimately, the cost of that is that rest is lost. That intimacy with God and a right covenantal relationship with God has been has been fractured, has been disrupted, and man's purpose of of rightly glorifying God seems to be in in jeopardy. Um, it's certainly in jeopardy. I think what I really want to kind of focus on is that we really see the problem of sin, and that we see that there there is a big problem caused by sin. If we look at uh, page 96 in Hunter and Wallum, and uh, we kind of see a couple comments on that. They, they pointed out how the metaphors of height and distance and light and fire serve to kind of share with us the, the serious problem of sin. It's not just a, a, a little infraction, you know. Uh, in a sense, Adam just ate one piece of fruit or, or Eve just ate one piece of fruit. But the reality is that in doing that, as I kind of talked about in our last lecture, they did so much more. They failed to trust God. They they listened to the lies of Satan. They ultimately called God a liar. Um, they challenged God. They went to war with God. And we see that we're really separated from that close covenant relationship with God. They point out, Hunter and Wallen point out, the first metaphor God gives us relates to height. God is the God most high. And this isn't connotating spatial height, but it refers to a transcendent lordship. He's the most high over all the earth, exalted over all cre all nations. If God is the, the most high, then his position and authority exceed that of all other persons. It's a vivid metaphor um, that, you know, you see it in Isaiah, as the, the authors point out. I saw the Lord high and exalted. The idea here is that there's a chasm between us and God, and God is so much higher. His ways are so much higher than our ways, and sin has only served to to accentuate that and 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 cause for more of a division between man and God. Uh, another one is distance, and they point out how there's a distance between man and God. Men had to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. There there had to be now, um, you know, God created a way. We'll see here in the in the Old Testament of of still interacting with humanity, but He had to speak to Moses on a mountain that was unapproachable by the rest of the country. Uh, the, the rest of the nation. He had to speak to, uh, he, he came in and lived within the within Israel in the tabernacle and later in the temple, but he was divided from the presence. The men were divided from the presence of God by the Holy of Holies, uh, by the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from, um, from the rest of the sanctuary. And ultimately, there's a division between man and God, and God couldn't go in man's presence without being to destroy they point about the images of light and fire. Uh, he appeared to Moses in a burning bush, and, and it's a terrifying concept that the light and the fire that God is represents is one that would consume or destroy man. You know, Moses had to hide in a rock and could only see the refracted image of the reflection of God, um, and even that changed him forever. And so if man was to come into the presence of God, they would man would be destroyed because of the sin that separates God from man. And, and it really doesn't just create a problem for man and the problem of sin, but it creates a problem for God in a sense. And, and in one sense, I don't mean it to be too literal, but there's a problem that God has, and that's the problem of forgiveness. 
you know, God is a holy God. He can't exist within with our sin. He can't, he can't tolerate our sin. He can't be in the presence of our sin. And so for God to forgive us, he can't just simply change the rules and say, you know what, it's okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Um, he's, the reality is, is that sin is a big deal and, and God just can't wipe it away. If he does, he wipes away his justice. So, so his mercy is now being held in tension with his justice. And, and that's why we see there's really only one possible solution. The full price of sin must be paid. And, and we know that the cause, the price for sin is death. And so Adam and Eve must be put to death. But even then we see God comes with, with grace and with mercy. And we see that even in the fact that God doesn't kill Adam and Eve right away. Rather, he, he pushes them out of the garden. And ultimately, he's going to create a solution, uh, the one that can only be found in Christ. And that's where we start with this uh, verse that we see in Genesis 3.15, a verse of hope. And that is um, in Genesis 3.15, in God giving the curse to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heels. That's a term, uh, kind of a Greek term called proto-evangelium. It's a kind of a amalgamation of two words. The first one is protos, which is just first, and evangelion, which means good news. So this is the first hint or the first good news in the Bible, the good news of how God will solve the problem of sin. We see in this verse the first hint of the gospel. Ultimately, only God himself can solve the problem of sin and the problem of forgiveness. And there's only one possible solution, and that's the work and uh, life and work and person of Christ. Man will never be able to cross that chasm. He'll never be able to ascend to the great mountain of, of height separating God from man. He'll never be able to enter into the presence of God and the Holy of Holies without being destroyed, at least not in his own power, on his own merits. Man will never be able to be in the presence of God's light and fire without being destroyed by them, unless God acts unilaterally, meaning in his own power, in his own work, to solve both the problems of sin and forgiveness. And he does that in the person and work of Christ. Man doesn't ascend to God. God takes on the form of man and descends to earth to, br to bridge the chasm. Man doesn't enter into the Holy of Holies until Jesus' righteousness is imputed to man, at which time God tears the curtain of the temple in two. Man doesn't face the fire and light of God in his own righteousness, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit as demonstrated with tongues of fire at Pentecost, and the light and fire of God enter man through the Holy Spirit in his act of regeneration at the moment of salva salvation. So man doesn't solve the problem of sin, and man doesn't solve God's problem of forgiveness. God solves it by sending God himself, his only son, to die in our place and to pay the full price for sin and to connect God back and to re restore that relationship between humanity and God. When we look at the exile from the garden or what happens after that, we see that God, man's wickedness only only multiplies. If you look at Genesis, uh, you know, four and continue on, you see immediately that Cain uh, kills his brother Abel in a jealous fit of rage. And then we see that Cain responds to God with evasiveness and blame shifting, much alike the way that Adam responded to God when confronted by God in the garden. And then as humans begin to multiply, so does their wickedness. If you look at Genesis six, verse five, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So make no mistake, the wickedness in man is pervasive and it's severe. It's not a, a simple little, um, you know, slight smudge. It's, it's a it's complete staining of, of sin. And yet God still shows his grace. The... The punishment for sin was death, but God could have killed Adam and Eve right there in the garden, but instead he showed them the grace by exiling them from the garden and by delaying their death for hundreds of years so they could still populate the earth. Sorry about that. He then gave us the hint of a solution in Genesis 3, as I just mentioned. Again, even as the descendants of Adam and Eve continue to fail and instead turn more wicked, God's justice is not void of grace. He made a provision for humanity here in Noah's Ark. 
And if we look and see Genesis 8 through 9, we see that Noah wasn't just any man. He was a righteous man. He was a man who was seeking after God and, and trying to do what was right in God's eyes. And he found favor in the Lord. And then I just want to think about Noah's Ark. You know, the authors of the book kind of tell us, hey, it's not a gentle little children's story. It's, it's a fun story for kids to think of the two pairs of animals and and all that kind of stuff. But really, it's a, a story of near mass extinction. It's like the whole population of animals and humans on the earth were completely destroyed. All the plant life was completely destroyed. So much so that, that only just a small, tiny remnant of the population was preserved on the ark. But it's a story of continuation. It's a story of God continuing his covenant with Adam through Noah. If we look at it, we can see some of these verses would be just good to look at. Genesis 7, 17 through 24, I'll, I'll read that. The floods continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated in the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all the flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land in whose on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him on the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So kind of just like as you think of like a cross being worn around somebody's neck. And I'm not against that, but it, it, it it's a it's a kind of a uh, sometimes a softening or we become accustomed to it when we think of Noah's ark. You know, the authors are right to kind of say, hey, this is more of a horror story than it is a, a kid's story. It's a story of killing every human being that walked on the face of the earth with the exception of a handful and killing every animal that walked on the face of the earth with the exception of a boatful. And ultimately uh, dealing with sin and showing the severity of sin. But then again, we have this hope. We have this ark, this remnant that was preserved. And God's covenant is renewed. We see that in Genesis 8. If we start by looking at verses 20 through 22, we see, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after he came out of the ark. And took some of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So he's making a sacrifice as prescribed by God of some of these animals to atone for, this, for his sin and his family's sin. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summertime and winter day and night shall not cease. So he's still making a provision for man. He's saying, we won't, I will never destroy the earth like this again and using a flood. But then he's also saying that as long as the earth remains, there will be some regularity to the seasons, to the morning and the evening and the seasons and the harvest time and the, and the time for sowing so that man can have a predictable world to live in and be able to, to again go about the commission of multiplying on the earth and filling the earth and surviving on the earth. If you look at Genesis 11 through uh, Genesis 9, 11 through 17, we get some more. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to, to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, meaning the rainbow, in the cloud, and it should be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And the while I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living thing, every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And when the bow is in the clouds, I will see and remember that the everlasting covenant between God and living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from the people of the whole earth were, were dispersed. And from them, the whole people of the whole earth were dispersed. So we see that, that God preserved 
a remnant and he's now commissioning them to go about and and giving them a mandate if you look at genesis 9 1 through 3 we see that and god blessed noah and his sons and he said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens upon everything that creeps in the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are delivered every morning Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. So he's saying, again, giving that same cultural mandate that he gave to um, Adam and Eve, he's saying, go out and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue the creation under your command so that you can extend humanity across the planet. And, and hopefully in a way that's God-fearing and God-honoring. But we still see that Noah, he shares Adam's problem, that problem of sin. Noah is a new Adam. He's a new representative of humanity. But almost immediately after uh, exiting the ark, God establishes his covenant with Noah, and then Noah is found drunk and naked in his tent. And we shall see the first hints that Noah is also going to fail in his role as a prophet, priest, and king. So again, where Adam failed, Noah is also going to fail. And instead of serving the Lord and honor and without sin, he again fails and falls into sin and does not live up to the expectation or the hope of what God had for humanity. And what we see here, though, is that this is a story of God's grace. His plans will not fail. Adam will fail. Noah will fail. Later, we're going to see that Abraham and Moses and David will fail. But ultimately, God will not fail. And ultimately, he's going to send a representative that won't fail in, in his covenant. He extends his covenant with humanity through Noah. Um, the authors point out that this is an extension of the cultural mandate and the covenant that was made to Adam is now being extended to Noah. It's not a new covenant exactly. It's a continuation of that covenant. And he promises not to destroy humans through a flood. And he then gives a foretaste of what's to come. In Noah, in his story, what we should see is that Noah's story is a story of God's judgment against humanity, and ultimately we're going to see another judgment against humanity, and it's going to be the final judgment where God's going to judge every human being according to their according to their works, and ultimately um, with Christ will be will be imputed His salvation, and will be imputed His works. So our works will be washed away. God's righteousness will be upon us, and so we'll we'll be able to stand not by our own works, but by his works through the grace of God and by his grace through his righteousness. He's going to promise not to destroy humanity again, as I mentioned, but there will be a final judgment and there will be ultimately the, the things of this earth and heavens will pass away and there will be a new creation. Um, but before that, we're going to see salvation. There's going to be a greater representative. There's going to be a representative that's greater than Adam and a greater greater than uh, Noah. We're going to see a savior that's truly going to save us from our sin and solve the problem once and for all in Christ. And then, as I mentioned, there's going to be a new creation. And the new creation will even be better. In the, new, in the original creation, when God created Adam in the art garden, Adam was free from sin. He did not yet have sin, but the capacity of sin still existed. In new creation, not only will we be free once once we're ultimately uh, given new bodies in heaven, but we'll not only be clean and pure and, and wiped, sin will be wiped away, but the threat of sin will be gone. There will be no, no capacity to sin because of the righteousness of Christ that's on us. And so ultimately, when we look at what happens in Noah's Ark, we can look back to the covenant that God made to Adam and see the continuation of that. But we can also look ahead and see that God is going to give us something much greater than Adam or Noah to come, and that we're going to see that 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 this is all pointing towards a much greater uh, solution, a much greater solution to the problem of sin. The solution of Noah is a temporary solution. It's 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 to reveal something greater that's to come, and that is what we'll see in Christ Jesus. So I thank you for taking time today. Um, I wish you well in your continued studies here. Let me know if there's anything I can help you with, but I'll be praying for you guys, and I love you guys. Um, thanks for taking this course, and thanks for listening to this lecture.